Okay, it's a pleasure for me to introduce a talk by Professor Zuzana Pumplu. Mm -hmm. uh, we, she will talk on non-associative algebras obtained from SKU polynomial rings and their applications. Thank you very much and thanks for the invitation. Um, what I want to do today is I want to give you a taste of my research area and about what I did, talk about what I did in the last uh, seven years. And um, in order to do so, I will have to introduce you very briefly to skew polynomial rings. And these I will then use to construct non-associative algebras. And these algebras have um, quite a range of applications, which I didn't notice when I found them by chance some years ago, and that can be used to kind of elaborate and expand on very classical problems for Amitsua, for instance, but they're also behind some space-time block codes. Now, space-time block codes, I will discuss a bit later, they are behind um, digital data transmissions, like when you're using your mobile phone. So whenever you're transmitting something digitally, it's very likely that there's some space-time coding involved. So let me start by giving you a very brief introduction about skew polynomial rings. So in this talk, I will take D to be a unital associative division ring. And sigma is going to be a ring endomorphism of D. And then I need to use sigma derivations. So these are additive maps delta from D to D that satisfy this um, equation I wrote here. And then the skew polynomial ring R, I call it R which is the ring which depends, well, we have an indeterminate T, and then it depends on sigma and delta. That's just gonna be the set of polynomials F. So we're just taking the usual polynomials the way you know them, where we have the AIs, the coefficients as elements in D, our division ring, where we have the usual addition, which you know when you add two polynomials, and the multiplication now is defined a bit differently because it's getting a twist. Because if you look at the rule, if you have a polynomial and you want to define, uh, you have two polynomials, say F and G, and you wanna define how you multiply these two, you will have to know what you do whenever you hit a term like T times A. So mind that the ring D I'm looking at here is not necessarily commutative. So the polynomials we're looking at here have coefficients in a non-commutative ring. So it actually is important if you write the a n, t n, for instance, here in the F, the a n on the left or on the right. And so if you want to multiply, the following rule applies. T times a, so whenever you have something where you have a coefficient a, in D on the right hand side of our T, you can shift it to the left by saying it's gonna be sigma of A times T plus delta of A. So this is kind of a multiplication with a twist. So the polynomials look like the polynomials you know. They have, however, coefficients in a non, not necessarily commutative ring D. And addition is the same, and the multiplication has this little twist in the rule. So let's look at an easy example. The, the easiest example of this type of ring is when you choose delta to be zero and sigma to be the identity. And then what you get is the usual multiplication where if you have two polynomials, as I wrote there, and you multiply them, you just get the usual multiplication, and this is actually just the ring of left polynomials over D. So now you can also define a degree. So 
for this type of polynomial. And the degree is exactly defined the same way as you would define a degree of a normal polynomial. So it's going to be minus infinity if the polynomial is zero. And otherwise, it's going to be the highest term Tn here if An is unequal to zero. It's also no surprise how to define irreducibility. So we say a skew polynomial F in our ring R is irreducible if it is no unit and it cannot be decomposed as a proper product of two polynomials. So you cannot write it as F equal G times h and g and h are not just some constants but real polynomials it's not possible if is irreducible i have to apologize my internet is very laggy and i'm isolating at home and just be patient i will be back okay so now the, the most important feature of such as Q polynomial ring R, the one we will need is the fact. So that means if we choose two polynomials F and G, and F is not zero, we can divide G by F. And there exists unique polynomials Q and R, such that we can write G as a multiple of F, Q times F, plus some remainder. R. And this is what's going to be crucial in our construction later. So you have heard a lot about non-associative algebras this week already, but let me quickly remind you of the features which I will need. So I will use a very general definition of an algebra. In this talk, F is always going to be a field. And then an algebra A over F for me is going to be an effect to space together with a bilinear map. And this bilinear map from A times A to A is going to be the multiplication of this algebra. Now we call A unital if it has a unit element. You will all know the definition I just remind you. Usually I denote this unit element by one sub A or just one. Now in this general context, A is called a division algebra if it's non-zero and non-zero element are always bijective maps. So this is the most general possible definition of an algebra. In case the dimension of this algebra, so the dimension of this as a vector space over F is finite, we know that the algebra is a division algebra if and only if it has no zero divisor. So that means we can conclude that if we have some product of two elements, A, X, and Y, and X times Y equals zero, we can conclude that either X or Y has to be zero. This can be very handy. And now, of course, we're dealing with non-associative algebras. And a very good way to measure how non-associative an algebra is, is the left, middle, right nucleus. So the definitions I wrote here. So we can define a left, a middle, and the right nucleus. And if we take the intersection of all three of these, we are getting the nucleus of A. The center of a non-associative algebra is defined similarly to the center of an associative one, but we are not just taking all the elements which commute with every other element in the algebra, we're also taking 
or those which lie in the nucleus. So these are very important um, well, ways to say classify if one wants to look at classifications or investigate algebras to always try to understand what is the left, the middle, the right nucleus, and what is the center. If you want to learn something about algebras, these are one of the first uh, questions we would ask if the algebras are non-associative. So now <clears throat> here comes my main construction. So what I want to do is now, I want to use some skew polynomial F and construct a non-associative algebra. So I'm taking a skew polynomial and I'm assuming from now on, this polynomial has degree M. So let's play a bit. So we know we have some ring R, our skew polynomial ring R. And we can look at the left ideal, which is generated by F. So we can look at R times F. All the elements of R multiplied with F. So this will be a left ideal. It will not always be a two-sided ideal, a left and a right ideal. But if we choose F the right way, it may be. So if this RF is a two-sided ideal, then we know that R mod RF is a classical quotient ring. But what happens if it's not? Well, there is quite some theory about this too, classical theory, and that will tell us, well, clearly we still have a structure. We have R mod RF, and this is going to be a left R module with a canonical uh, addition and multiplication induced on it. But what most people do not know, and what is sometimes actually implicitly used in the literature for coding theory, but was never really explicitly stated is that this actually also has a non-associative ring structure. So this is a result which is as old as I am and goes back to Petit. It is in a preprint by Petit and that preprint has actually been quite ignored. And I came across that by pure chance because I was actually looking at um, constructing uh, codes and I tried to understand what one can do with non-associative algebras because there was a hype six or seven years ago where people started to construct systematically space-time block codes. And I'll talk about that a bit later using uh, quaternion algebras or cyclic algebras and general central simple algebras. And I knew from some work with Vincent Astier that there was something called a non-associative quaternion algebra. And I thought, hell, this behaves so, so kind of nicely similarly to quaternion algebras. The construction could also work for that one. And this kind of kicked the ball loose so that when I started the literature research, I came across a paper by Lavrin and Chiquet on actually division algebras over finite fields. And they cited this theorem by Petit. And this is how I came across these algebras. So the algebras are constructed as follows. I'm taking the uh, set of all these Q polynomials of degree strictly less than M. Remember, I chose and fixed some polynomial F of degree M. So I'm choosing all those which have degree less than M. And I define the usual polynomial addition on it. And I define a new multiplication on the set now. And the multiplication I define so that I take two polynomials in the set, G and H, I multiply them by saying I take the new polynomial I get by multiplying this G times H, I get a polynomial. Of course, this does not have degree less than M, but I'm then dividing out the F. 
So this will have so and so many copies of F in it, Q times F plus some remainder. And the remainder is going to be of degree strictly less than M. And the multiplication of G times H is going to be defined exactly as this remainder R. So this is well defined. And this actually yields us a unital non-associative ring, which I will call SF in this talk. And this ring turns out to be an algebra over a subfield F naught of D. And this F naught is defined as I wrote there. Here. Now the elegant bit is that this is actually a straightforward generalization of the usual quotient algebra, because one can show that this SF, this non-associative algebra I just defined, is actually associative if and only if the ideal generated by F is not just left-sided, this ideal RF, but a two-sided ideal. And in that case, we actually Reobtaining the classical quotient algebra, which we usually would obtain by just factoring out a two sided ideal of this ring R. So this can be seen as a canonical generalization of this construction. And now Petit proved the following interesting uh, main results. Um, in order to avoid the trivial cases, we're just assuming that F always has degree greater or equal to two now. And then we know that if F is irreducible and the algebra we are looking at, this as F, is finite dimensional over the F naught, then it is a division algebra. Even if it's not finite dimensional, we can say if F is irreducible, then this is equivalent to saying that this algebra has no zero devices. Now, in the case which we are usually going to study, SF is going to be not associative because the associative case is already covered in the literature because that's the usual quotient algebra. So if SF is not associative, then we know that the left nucleus and the middle nucleus is going to be our division algebra D and the right nucleus is the interesting bit. The right nucleus is going to be all the Gs in the algebra where F times G lies in RF. Why is this interesting? Well, this is the one which kind of wobbles and gets bigger or smaller, depending on the choice of our F. And in case you're a bit familiar with uh, the theory of skew polynomials, you might recognize at this point that what I wrote on the right-hand side is actually what people in working in skew polynomial rings call the eigenspace of F. This is a very important invariant of a polynomial, of a skew polynomial. So if SF is not associative, the right nucleus encodes a huge amount of information about our polynomial F that we used to construct our algebra. And indeed, if F is irreducible, this right nucleus is an associative division algebra, division algebra. Nuclear always associative algebras, but we can say if F is irreducible, this is even a division algebra. So here's an example which you um, might recognize. Let's look at Hamilton's quaternion algebras in this context. So we're taking the complex numbers and we're taking complex conjugation. And we're looking at the uh, skew polynomial ring C, T, and using the complex conjugation to be our sigma here. And our F is going to be 
t squared plus one. So we are modding out the ideal generated, the left ideal generated by t squared plus one here. So this happens to be a two-sided ideal. Since we are modding it out in this uh, new ring, we have t squared equals minus one. And this is a two-sided ideal in this case. So we're having the classical situation of a quotient algebra and an associative ring that we obtain. And this happens to be exactly Hamilton's quaternion algebra over the reals. So this is one way to write down Hamilton's quaternion algebras. Perhaps you've seen it, perhaps you haven't. So now let's fiddle with it a bit. Let's take a polynomial that looks very similar and still will give us a completely different algebra. Let's take the polynomial f of t, which is t squared plus i. What happens now? So we're taking the same skew polynomial ring, c, t, and the complex conjugation. We're taking the left ideal, which is generated by our polynomial t squared plus i, and we're modding that out. And this is an example of this SF construction. So this is a non-associative algebra, a unit of one. And this is an algebra which has left, left and middle nucleus C, and the right nucleus is what I just defined here. I leave that open for now. And this actually is very interesting because this algebra is called a non-associative quaternion algebra. Since t squared plus i happens to be irreducible, one can show that it is a division algebra. And this is actually, to my knowledge, the first known example of a non-associative division algebra that appeared in the literature. And it goes back to Dixon, and he wrote it up a bit differently, but it amounts to exactly this algebra. And he gave that example in 1935. So it's a very classical example. These algebras were then very um, systematically investigated, these non-associative quaternion algebras, for the first time by Waterhouse in 87. And um, these are the first ones I actually met of this type, of this SF algebra type. And I wrote a paper on them and actually generalized the whole construction over base rings with STA and basically started to uh, get a first taste of this algebra this, this class of algebras, which then later led me to looking at them concerning um, the problems I started having with digital data transmission. So next question, of course, you can do a lot of maths. And at some point, you should always ask yourself, is this actually useful? At least if you live in the UK, because we have impact factors and such. So is this actually useful to study these algebras? And the answer turns out to be a very resounding yes. I will talk about all the applications at the very end a bit more, but for instance, um, the way I found them was through the application when you're looking at finite fields and trying to look at how to construct division algebras, finite dimensional division algebras over finite fields. And this way you obtain algebras, which are also known as Pia Johnson semifields. And this was this paper, how I found the algebras written by Lavrau and Schicke and that appeared in Advances in Geometry in 2013. And perhaps very important for our talk, they can be also seen as classical generalizations or as generalizations of classical central simple algebras. You just saw that we could generalize a quaternion algebra 
to a non-associative criterion in algebra. And finally, the uh, properties of this generalization of this non-associative criterion in algebra are ridiculously similar to the ones of a classical one. For instance, this is an algebra which will only have inner automorphisms too. Although, of course, let's just forget that we don't really know how to define inner automorphisms at this point in this general context, but they behave ridiculously analogous to the associative counterparts. And they are good enough in that sense to use them to do code constructions with them, which have been done with a classical central simple algebra. So for example, let's look at cyclic algebras. So I don't know if you have ever heard about a cyclic associative central simple algebra, but I can kill that basically in one swoop. I just give you the definition in general. So if we have a cyclic Galois field extension K over F, and say that field extension has degree M. And cyclic Galois extension means that the Galois group of this field extension is generated by one automorphism. Let's call that sigma. Then we can use this Galois field extension to define a cyclic um, algebra, graph. And how we do it is we are taking the uh, skew polynomial ring K T sigma. And we choose as our polynomial F in the construction, the polynomial T to the M minus C, where C is some non-zero element in K. And then we're just uh, writing down our SF for this ring R and for this polynomial. So I wrote uh, the um, multiplicative structure here, how it's generated, just for your interest. So you can see that if you're multiplying something like a t to the i times b t to the j, you will actually, if i plus j is strictly less than m, this is just the way we define a multiplication in the skew polynomial ring uh, k t sigma. But if the product gives you something which is i plus j and i plus j here and the exponent is greater or equal to m, we have to say we have to do this minus m times the c which is the constant here in the f and then we are getting this kind of skewed multiplication. And this of course will be linearly extended and gives us a way how to multiply two polynomials in this algebra. And this particular example of the algebra SF with this, these choices is called a non-associative cyclic algebra of degree M. And it is called uh, and denoted and written exactly the same way we would write an associative cyclic algebra by writing it like this, K over F sigma C. And here's why. If we choose C in F, and non-zero, we are again just getting the classical case of an associative cyclic central simple algebra over F. So you can see this is a very easy generalization where we are allowing the C in here not to just lie in F, which would be the classical case of an associative cyclic algebra. We allow it to be in K. And it will still be an algebra, it will still be unital, it will still have only inner automorphisms, but it is highly non-associative. And these algebras are behind some very fast decodable code constructions. So now I'm flipping and I will talk a bit about coding, theory about encoding. Um, whenever you pick up your mobile phone, you will use probably what is called the Alamuti code. The Alamuti code was found by an engineer called Alamuti. And what is behind is the left regular representation of uh, Hamilton's quaternions. Now, of course, uh, the engineers didn't know that. 
And some years later, uh, this was implemented and it's still implemented in most of your mobile phones. And a mobile phone has one antenna in it. And usually the data you need for making a phone call will be sent through one or two antennas and they will send multiple redundant copies so that of course, well, there will be something lost when you're transmitting the data, there will be some mountain in between or some magnetic field so that not all of the data will arrive at the receiver in your little phone so that you have enough to make a sensible phone conversation so that you can decode enough to actually make sense of the data. You will need to have multiple copies. And basically some mathematicians then came and said, but this is not Alamuti, this is a quaternion algebra. This is Hamilton who is behind that. And then since they were smart and they knew about central simple algebras, they started to generalize this and churned out for the first time, lots and lots of codes, which were very, very, they called them perfect. So they were very, very well functioning by using cyclic associative division algebras and their left multiplication, their left regular representation. And then I came along and I thought, oh, there are these non-associative quaternion algebras. They behave so well. Can't I do the same if I look at the left multiplication of those? And indeed, that was possible. So a space-time block code is what is used when you're taking your phone or a portable DV or any other device and you digitally transmit data. And in pure math speak, this is just a family of complex matrices. So for our talk, it's going to be a family of M by M complex matrices. And this is called a space-time block code, just some family. So when you're transmitting data, you will transmit multiple copies, redundant. So you want to compensate for losing, compensate for losing some. And each column in the matrix is transmitted from M transmit antennas. And after M columns are transmitted, the R receive antennas process the data and try to recover them. Usually R is one, two, or three. But the theory is most often developed for a whole range of most general cases of M and R. Now, of course, you want to have a code which you can use. So that means you don't lose much energy decoding the data once you get them. You don't lose much energy transmitting the data and the data can actually be recovered. So there's a whole list of design criteria now which make a code well performing. So I will not talk about them. I will just give you some easy ones which are relevant in this talk. So what we are doing or what the engineers are doing, the non-pure mathematicians, they work with matrices over number fields. So for instance, they work with matrices over Q adjoined some root of unity, characteristic not two. What we want is we want a set of matrices, a family of matrices, a set of matrices, a code C, to be linear. That means if we have two matrices and we add them or we subtract them from each other, we will get again a matrix which lies in that set. And we want it to be fully diverse. So that means all the matrices in the set have to be invertible. So this is what we are aiming at. And there are more subtle ones, but I'm dropping them for now. I just want to give you a taste. Now, as an example, as I already said, cyclic division algebras, and we need division here in order to make the code fully diverse. They have been highly successfully used to systematically build codes. And here's how they were built. So we take a, an associative cyclic algebra, K over F sigma C, like this one. So C lies in F. So the, the way to write it in our context of this talk here would be to write the algebra like this. And we take it of degree M. So that means the K over F is going to be of degree M, the Galois field extension, and the degree of this F polynomial here is also M. 
And then we write K with respect to a K basis. So we write A as K plus KT plus KT squared plus K T to the M minus one. And so we can write each element in this algebra as the sum of, uh, as a polynomial with um, coefficients in capital K here. And now we want to write the left multiplication with an element X in A. So we're taking some X and we write left multiplication, multiplication um, by X as L sub X is that map. And this is a map in the endomorphism ring of A. And these are actually K endomorphisms. We're using a K basis here. We're looking at A as a K vector space. And then we are writing this endomorphism using a K basis, the basis one T T squared up to T to the M minus one as an M by M matrix. And the left multiplication, if we do that, is given by exactly this matrix here, where the xi line k. So this is the left multiplication in a cyclic algebra, where we are reading the algebra as a k vector space. And if we're taking the set of all these matrices, this gives us the fully diverse linear space-time block code, fully diverse if the algebra is division algebra. Linear because if we take two of these and add them or subtract them, we'll again get a matrix of exactly the same type. The only problem for these codes, and these are actually called perfect codes because that they had a very high decoding complexity. So a lot of energy was used to decode whatever ended up at the receiver. And now the hunt started. So people had this very elegant way of constructing codes and they wanted more. They always want more. They want cheaper and faster and easier, less energy using. And so there was this race of mathematicians and engineers trying to improve the constructions. And the goal was to construct space-time codes for less receive than transmit antennas, because normally whatever you carry will have less room for antennas. And you want them to be fast decodable. You want them to be systematically built so that you have a given number of antennas. You can say, here's the code. And then this is not nice anymore. Let's do a faster one. Here's the next one. Da, 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 da. So there were lots of ad hoc constructions. Engineers usually do ad hoc constructions and they just do lots of experiments and they kind of cobble it together. And then the mathematicians came in, Markin and Augier, and they are number theorists. They have a background in number theory. And they were some of the first, they gave some of the first non ad hoc constructions. And then two engineers, Srinath and Ryan, came in and also gave some. The problem with Srinath and Ryan's construction was that they needed a lot of zeros in the matrices to get fully diverse codes. And that, of course, meant a waste of space. Because if you have to transmit a large matrix, 60% uh, of whatever you're transmitting is going to be zeros. It's just a waste. But they needed that to enforce that the codes were all of invertible matrices. These <clears throat> codes that Markin and Augier found, they were actually fast decodable for 2S transmit and 2 receive antennas. And so in a way better than the first ones here, which had a high decoding complexity, which used cyclic social algebras. So now I come in and I started to use these algebras as F. <clears throat> and I was able to build a code of rate free, whatever that means. And that was working, or it's working for six transmit and free receive antennas. And that achieved certain optimality criteria, which were actually 
um, better than other codes by Pecalati, Holanti, and Ogier. And I want to tell you how. What I did is I took a cyclic division algebra of degree M, a classical one. That was my D. I chose the skew polynomial ring D T sigma, uh, tor, let's call it tor. And tor is rather complicated, so I'm not telling you how tor looks. You would get scared and run away. So I choose some tor. And, and then I choose F to be T to the N minus D. And I was able to show that if I take the matrix, which gives me the left multiplication or the sets of the set of matrices that represent the left multiplication of this algebra here. And I choose my F or my D here the right way. Then I obtain the codes constructed by Srinath and Rayan. And they were constructed relatively haphazardly with no algebra behind it, they thought. And if I choose D as an element of F, I generalize the ones, the codes by Markin and Ogier. And it's very easy for me in the context of this theory I'm using to show that if F is irreducible, that C is a fully diverse space-time block code, and it can be used for NM transmit and M receive antennas. And the uh, engineers, they were really working very hard to show that the algebras, that the uh, matrices were invertible. And here it just falls out as a byproduct of the class of reducible. So the SF must be a division algebra if it's finite dimensional. Now Srinath and Rayan obtained this condition for full diversity, which would translate to us knowing that SF is a division algebra, only when N and M are two, and Markin and Ogier only for N equals to two, M equal to two, or M equal to three. I get it in general, because I have the theory by Petit. So this is one section. Another aspect I want to quickly touch upon is that we can also use um, the algebra SF, to obtain very pure results and also expand on very classical results by Amitsuo, for instance. So let's look at a completely different setup now. Let's assume the characteristic of the field F is zero. And let's assume that K over F now is a field extension such that F is algebraically closed in K. And I'm looking at a completely different setup. I'm actually choos choosing sigma to be the identity and I don't choose delta to be zero like in the previous examples. I choose delta to be a sigma derivation where the constant field of sigma is defined as all the a in k, where the derivation of a is zero, and that is going to be f. I want that to be exactly f. There are lots of examples like this. I give one at the end. Hmm. Now, there's a very classical result by Amitsur from 1954 that I can rewrite in this context now using the algebra SF. And that says that if I have a central simple algebra A over F of degree M, like the cyclic ones we just saw on the previous slides, for example, and we know this algebra is split by K, so that means that it becomes a matrix algebra M of M by M matrices with entries in K, when I tensor it with K and go to the base from the base field F to the field K, then I can find some F 
of degree M such that A can be written as the right nucleus of the algebra SF. So this result is due to Amitsu. I just rewrote it and kind of plugged in the algebra SF here. It's not written expressing the SF in that paper. And then I went on and I showed that actually, if I take any central simple algebra, A over F of degree M, it's known that there is a field extension splitting A, K, and where F is algebraically closed. So this is general theory um, that is well known, where F is algebraically closed in K. And um, I can show that there is a polynomial F of degree m such that SF is an infinite dimensional algebra over F and the right nucleus is A. And of course, the middle and left nucleus we know is automatically going to be K. So I can show there exists such a polynomial. So the right nucleus here is the central simple algebra. This is actually another question which was asked by Amitsur in the same paper. He asked about what um, polynomials F in a skew polynomial ring would have an eigenspace which happens to be a central simple algebra. So there are lots of questions here which are very classical and have been asked many years ago, which can be addressed now using these very new type, types of algebras. So I finish with one example. So if I take the real numbers and I take the algebra minus one minus one over R, so this is Hamilton's quaternion algebra. And then I take K to be the function field of the projective real conic, which is defined by X squared plus Y squared plus Z squared equals zero. Then I would have K over F as I require it, and K splits Hamilton's quaternion algebra. And the general theory says there's always a derivation delta where the constant field of that derivation is R. There are several of this, many. Take one of these. Then I know that there will be an F in KT delta of degree two, such that if I form the algebra using this F, our algebra is F, this is going to be an infinite dimensional unit algebra. And the right nucleus of it is going to be Hamilton's quaternion algebra. Just one example. Now there is a whole range of other applications and I'm just touching on some now and then I finish. <clears throat> so, <clears throat> one can generalize the whole theory actually and define these algebras also when D is not necessarily a division ring. It's enough to define everything so that it's well defined to assume that the <clears throat> polynomial F we're using in our construction has an invertible leading coefficient. And this actually leads eventually to constructions where we can find <coughs> non-associate algebras on subsets of quantum planes, whale algebras, et cetera, and kind of do some kind of inductive process. <clears throat> then uh, these algebras I just talked to you about are actually behind linear F sigma delta codes. Um, these are also called skew cyclic codes. Then once you know that, you can use applications um, to these codes. So there's coset coding. You can use these algebras to do coset coding to generalize the classical construction A for lattices from linear codes. You can canonically construct lattices from cyclic F sigma delta codes over finite rings and so on. You can also obtain results on solvable cross products algebras or reobtain them. Some of them are. Um, in a classical algebra book whose author I forgot right now. And, and then we can look at other classical concepts by Jacobson, Albert, Amitsur, 
like I just did in the last section. And we can, for instance, also construct not just, I mean, there's something which is called differential algebras. I don't have time to look at that right now, but one can do something like non-associative differential algebras. Again, they will have similar automorphisms like the differential ones. Again, they will behave very similarly. So there are quite a range of applications, both applied and pure for these algebras. And I just wanted to give you a kind of a taster session, a flavor of this theory, and I hope you liked it. Thank you for having me speak here. And that's the end of my talk. Thank you for the talk. Uh, is there any question? I have a small question. Uh, may I ask? Uh, uh, what about uh, so? If you, uh, what what is the role of uh, of the center in this sense of uh, as you defined uh, um, as, uh, as you defined uh, with the intersection uh, for, for non-associative station? What is the role of the central uh, elements in uh, for this code? Um, for these algebras, the center usually <clears throat> is going, for instance, it's a very, very general construction you might have noticed. So mm -hmm. if you're looking at the example which I gave, uh, let's look at the, let's be as precise as possible. Um, easiest example here. So if you have, um, Hamilton's quaternion algebras, everybody will know the center of this algebra is going to be the real numbers, right? So now if you look at the non-associative quaternion division algebras, the center of this one is actually also going to be R. If you then look at the other example I gave here, the non-associative cyclic algebra of degree M, both the associative and the non-associative cyclic algebra, both will have center F. So they're behaving exactly the same way. And actually most of the time, and I don't, I mean, there are some pathological cages, but, but in a lot of cases, F naught is going to be the center. Let's say it like this carefully, not always. So it's a very good question. It's a very difficult question. And in a lot of cases, this F naught actually is not just some subfield over which we can look at it. It is usually contained in the center, but it actually very often is the center. And so, what? So the, the, the other part of my question was, uh, uh, what what is the role of the center, this uh, central elements in this sense? What is the role in this uh, codes which you consider mm -hmm. in the encoding? Well, part actually, I, I don't think they play a particular role in the codes. To be honest, not that I remember right now. Um, what plays a role in the codes is the right nucleus. Because once you're looking at uh, what I'm doing then is if I look at the classical construction here in this example, I gave this example for associative algebras. If I would take a non-associative algebra and do exactly the same code construction so that the C here would lie in K, not in F, hmm. uh, then I would actually need not the center. I would need that in order to do this and to get a code which exactly looks like this, just that the C here is in K and not in F, and it will perform exactly the same. The problem here is that it's only well defined if the right nucleus is K. And so the center actually does not play a big role in this construction, the right nucleus does. Uh -huh. Okay, okay, so, 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 so the central elements are not... Uh, they're not that relevant, no, they're not. The right nucleus is, the right nucleus is the kind of crux here. Uh -huh. Okay. Okay, thank you very much. Very interesting. Uh, you uh, you have some some in your slides or in somewhere some literature, especially about this part which you have now on the screen. Uh, so some 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 paper or something which one could take a look at. Yes, yes, I have a lot of papers on this. If you look at look me up on MathSignet, you will immediately see all the papers with codes and so on. Yeah, yeah. yeah especially this this construction with the left. Yeah, yeah, it's all in my thing. papers. All in my papers. Yeah. And much more, much more. This is just a survey talk. Uh -huh. Okay, thanks. Thanks. Right. You're welcome. Okay, thank you. There's another question by Alexander Buterman, please. 
Um, thank you for the very interesting talk. I wonder what happens uh, in the case of uh, skew Laurent polynomials. Uh, so um, you allow negative degrees there, and uh, there are classical results of uh, Paul Kohn describing when uh, this uh, ring will be the vision ring and so on. Have you heard any progress in this direction so far? And now because what I need in the whole construction is something which is only existing. So if you look at the construction, the crux of the matter is this uh, division algorithm where that there's a right yeah. division algorithm in the ring and the only rings that actually have this, where is it now here, this right division algorithm is needed. And the only rings that actually have this are basically these rings. Mm -hmm. So the whole construction tanks, if I don't have some right division algorithm, division algorithm, because I need a well-defined area, otherwise the definition isn't there for the multiplication. I did look at it. I tried to. Exp I, I did look at this actually, and I looked at several other kind of generalizations, and they also generalized uh, right division algorithms. But at least from what I could see, is I wasn't able to get any further because I was always missing something to make the whole thing well defined. I see. I see. And that carried over, unfortunately, to all the applications. <laughs> no. Thank you. Thank you very much. More questions? No? Okay, thank you.